And if you don't have a Bible with you, don't worry. Oh man, I left it at home, or it's in the car, or I don't have the app on my phone yet. We've got one for you, right in front of you. Look right there in the pew rack. The black one says, Holy Bible, take that one. And turn to page 1045. 1045, James chapter 3, this morning. We've been doing a series on Sunday mornings called Insignificant. How little things matter. Insignificant, how the little things matter. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about this, a spark. A spark. And we'll get to that in just a minute. Um, one of my least favorite pastimes as a preacher or a teacher of the Bible is lying in bed at night on Saturday and thinking about, as I cannot sleep, what I will say the next day as I teach and preach the Word of God. Just the things that go through your mind and you're praying and asking God to help you and, and you don't want to mess it up and you, you want to say it in a way that will be understandable and you want God to move in the middle of the preaching and you want to be just the voice and Him to be the, the one who's doing the work. And, but it just consumes you. And, and Saturday nights I don't rest much. Uh, in fact, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning. Dave, you'll like this. I turned on the Golf Channel because the uh, British Open was live at 2.30 in the morning, you know, and, and uh, so I was kind of just trying to watch that to fall asleep. And if that can't put you to sleep, I don't know what can, you know. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I struggle with that on Saturday nights. And then the second worst night, or maybe even worse than Saturday night, is Sunday night. Lying in bed, thinking of what? All the things I said, you know. And, you know, thinking about, wow, I shouldn't have said that. Why did you say that? Uh, I could have said that better. Ah, you, you got that one right. Um, I think that made sense. And you want to elbow Jamie at 2 in the morning. Did that make sense? But you don't do that, you know. And, and uh, it's just thinking about what I am going to say on Saturday, Saturday nights, thinking about what I said on Sunday nights, and those of you who teach are probably a little bit in that same boat. Now, my calling is about words, and, and I'm to communicate what God has said to us through His Word. And that's clearly a huge responsibility. But you know, most other days of the week, I don't typically lay awake thinking about what I said that day or what I'm going to say the next day. And maybe I should. Maybe we all should. Today's passage tells us that we need to be careful with our words. I want, I want to ask this question this morning. How often do we consider the words we speak each day? We live in a culture and in a day and age where we want to be heard. Everybody wants to be heard. We want to speak up. We want to give our thoughts, our opinion. In the Bible here, especially in James chapter 3, he's very, very poignant about how we should treat our words. Words carry great consequence. Think about it. Just a few bits of ink on a page. A few letters put together on a screen or given audibly can do a great deal of harm or a great deal of healing. The smallest word or briefest sentence carries great power. And so here's the thought. Do I think before I speak, or nowadays, type? Today we're going to be reminded of the life-changing power of words. James chapter 3, let's read verses 1 through 12. James 3, beginning in verse 1. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horses' mouths, that they may obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which, though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue 
is a little member and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beasts, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind, but the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Therewith bless we God, even the Father. And therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Either a vine, figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray this morning. Our Father, we thank you for the time we've had already in singing your praise and recognizing your holiness and desiring to be closer drawn to you. And Lord, as we've been made to consider you this morning in our song, I ask that now as we come to your word, that you would grab a hold of our hearts and our minds and Lord that we would hear you above all and as your Holy Spirit does speak to our hearts that we would obey him Lord that we would give honest evaluation of our hearts and minds and and Lord in our words I ask that as you bring this truth to our attention this morning Lord we would consider uh, the words that we speak and type, and Lord, that you would bring conviction where it's needed, and Lord, I ask that you would do your work today, that souls would be saved, and Christians would be more like Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. So at the Cincinnati Zoo each year in January, they have what they call a penguin parade. Has anybody ever been to the penguin parade? Raise your hand. Okay, we've got a few. All right, so I've never been to one. But it is the, one of the most goofy and oddly satisfying things I've ever seen in my life. Uh, people go to the zoo in January, and they line up along the walkways of the zoo, and the zookeepers bring out some penguins, a handful of penguins, and they just the penguins start walking down the walkways of the zoo. And you know how funny it is to watch a penguin walk to begin with, right? And then you've got four or five of them just kind of waddling in a row. And then people get in line and follow behind them. And it's like 20 degrees out. It's so weird to me. Uh, But it's oddly satisfying watching penguins walk along this walk, and they know right where they're going. And uh, I find it interesting that it's like a big deal that they have this penguin parade, and everybody loves this. Now, what you'll probably never hear of at the zoo is a lion parade. Where the zookeepers bring out the lions and just turn them loose on the walkways and everybody's standing along the side with their children and you know watching and they get in behind the lions and just walk through the you're probably never going to see that okay and why is that well we know that the reason that they have a penguin parade and not a lion parade is because with great potential to destroy something like that must be controlled as much as possible you can't turn lions loose you just can't and Our words are kind of like lions in the animal kingdom. Under control, they're great. But when they're just turned loose, they can cause great destruction. And James' admonition about our words kind of lines up with that thinking about turning loose a lion. Uh, Since our words have potential to do great damage, we must manage them carefully. You know, it's something to be said, too, about putting our words on parade. i got to remind us, every time we put something on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever, we're putting our words on parade. And even more than that, even more significant than that, we're putting our heart on parade. 
And so James tells us that we need to be very careful with our words. Let's look at what he says here in James 3. Dive into his specifics here in the Word of God. First of all, he talks about in verse 1 how we need to be careful directing with our words. Directing with our words. Look at verse 1. He says, My brethren, my brothers, be not many masters. And today we would say, uh, My brothers, uh, don't many of you desire to be teachers? Many of you should not desire to be teachers. Why? Look what he says. Knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. By we, he means teachers, proclaimers, givers of truth. He says, look, many of us should not desire to be a teacher because with teaching comes greater judgment, stricter judgment. Could you imagine at school if uh, your teacher had walked into the room and said, okay, everybody, uh, the scale today is 90 to 100 is A, 80 to 89 is B, 70 to 79 is C. But for you, 98 to 100 is A, 96 to 97 is B. Well, you wouldn't like that. You wouldn't want to be under stricter judgment than everyone else. But the fact of the matter is, God just says that teachers will face stricter judgment because teachers are setting themselves up as an authority on truth. And so if you have an inkling to teach or a desire to teach, be careful, James says, because you will be held to stricter judgment than the rest. Beware that your words carry much weight as a teacher. People are looking to you to obtain truth. Be careful of how you study that you do know the truth yourself. And be careful in the manner in which you give truth. A warning to teachers, we will face stricter judgment. It is a great responsibility to give truth. And we must do it with sincerity in our hearts and honesty as we go. Now, because we are flawed people, there are times when we're going to get it wrong. But it should never be intentionally, listen, and it should never be due to a lack of study. When you hold the responsibility of teaching the truth, you better know what you're talking about and give time to the word. So James says right off the bat, when we direct with our words, we need to be extremely careful because we will face stricter judgment. And then number two in verses two through five, he tells us about controlling our words. He discusses controlling our words, guarding our words. Look what he says, for in many things we offend all. There's many ways we offend. We, we offend many people in many ways, don't we? That's life. But look what he says. If any man, but if there is someone who does not offend in word, who can guard their words, the same as a perfect man. Now that doesn't mean sinless. It means he's a little bit mature and he understands the value of his words. Okay, He understands that he needs to control them because they can do great harm or great healing. He says if anybody can control his words or not offend in words, he is a perfect mature man and able also to bridle the whole This is an individual with self-control. Have you ever wondered, do I have self-control? Well, a real quick way to answer that is, do I control my words? Because the Bible says the person who can't control their words can't control their body. And vice versa. It's It's just a symptom of one or the other. And if you see a person who's erratic and crazy, they probably can't control their words. You see somebody who's loose lipped and yelling and screaming and hollering, they probably can't control their body. Beware beware controlling our words the person who can keep from stumbling in his words is someone who has great self-control verse 3 behold we put bits in the horses mouths that they may obey us and we turn their whole body it's amazing isn't it something as large and powerful as a horse you put a little piece of metal in its mouth and you can direct it however you desire turn it left or right something that powerful can be steered with just a small piece of metal and so is the body we uh the small little member the bible calls it the 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 body member the the tongue is a very small thing and seemingly insignificant when you consider the heart and the brain and all these other things but how much power does it yield and so james says it's kind of like a bit in the horse of a mouth it's it's a small little thing but man it controls 
something of great power. And then the next illustration in verse 4, Behold also the ships, which though they be so great and are driven of fierce winds, yet they are turned around uh, about with a very small helm or rudder. Wherever the governor, the captain, wherever he decides, he can turn that wheel or, or turn that prop and, and that little bitty prop can take that whole ship and turn it in a direction. Seems insignificant. Seems like a very small part of the boat. But what power it yields. What an incredible thing it is. If you've ever kayaked with somebody, or canoed with somebody, tandem or more than that, you always put the person who knows how to steer in the back. Right? You with me on that? Because if you don't know how to steer a kayak or canoe, you're going to just be doing this the whole time or yeah, circling the whole time. Just that little paddle in the back on the right side will turn you to the right. If you stick the paddle in the, ba the back on the left side, it'll turn you to the left. It's amazing. The power that it wields. It's just like the tongue. The tongue is a small part of the body, but wow, what can it do? Danger is the sign that's flashing. You know, like I said earlier, we live in a day and age where everybody wants to be heard. That's what social media is really all about, is everybody getting to air out their opinions. Um, I want you to keep your finger in James 3. You've got to turn here with me. This is an incredible passage. Go to Proverbs 18, okay? Keep your finger there in James 3 and go to Proverbs 18. I did not have a, a page number on that. I didn't really intend on turning there. Can somebody, uh, if you know it, can you yell that out? Proverbs 18. 577, thank you. Proverbs 18, page 577 in the Pew Bible. Check this out, Proverbs 18, 2. You think that the Bible is ancient and that it doesn't really have anything to do with, did you know Proverbs 18, 2 is a verse about social media? Seriously, check this out, check this out. Proverbs 18, 2. A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. All right. So that's what they said in 1611. Nowadays we would say this. Fools have no interest in understanding something. Their only concern is that they want their own opinions expressed. So, be careful with social media. And, and the Bible says that fools, they don't care about learning or gaining knowledge or understanding things. All they want to do is be heard. I just need to be heard because I'm smarter than everybody else or I know better than everybody else. The Bible says that's foolish. Um, James even says, be slow to speak, swift to hear. Right? That's why God gave us two ears and one tongue, right? We need to be more willing to listen than to talk. Talking is what will get us in trouble, folks. Okay, And so, uh, maybe Proverbs 18.2 would be a good verse for us to consider before we post something on social media. Say, well, I'm allowed to express my... You, you are. Free country. Freedom of speech. But you're also free to express the fact that you're a fool. Keep that in mind. Think before you type. How about doing some research before you take somebody to task in a public forum like that? Our words carry very much power. And James, can you believe that James in Proverbs has a word about social media? Isn't that something? I mean, hey, they could have known that. All right, be careful about what we say and what we type. The third thing we notice back in James chapter 3 is the potential of words. The, the potential of great harm and great healing that words have. Okay, look at verse number 6. He says, And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, and setteth on fire the course of nature, and is set on fire of hell. Small. You see in verse 5, even so the tongue is a little member and it boasts 
great things. Behold how great a matter, a little fire kindled, a spark. Just a little spark. 140 characters on a Twitter post. Facebook lets you do more than that. But just a little spark. You ever seen a little spark on social media? Somebody will post a little opinion. And then the fire, right? All the comments that follow. And you got people fighting and screaming and hollering and cussing and yelling and threatening. And one little, one little thought, one little spark. Be careful. The tongue is a fire. A world of iniquity. In November of 2016, right around Thanksgiving time, down in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, a great fire consumed a lot of land. This fire killed 24 people. It injured almost 200 more. It caused $500 million worth of damage. And listen, 17,136 acres of forest were burnt up. If you've, ever had the, if you've ever looked at the videos of the police and the fire and the ambulance going through the streets warning people to get out of their homes, on either side of the street, just everything is ablaze. There's a video you can watch of a police officer coming down. I don't know if it's Airport Road or not. It's the one there by the convention center when you're coming down the hill toward the needle. And if you look up where the ski lift goes, the whole side of the mountain is on fire. All those homes and businesses and people being burnt up. It all started. Two young men at the top of Chimney Tops Trail playing with a match. Those boys had no idea that day that when they were playing with matches that that was going to take 24 lives and cause a half a, mil half a billion dollars worth of damage. No idea that just that little spark from a match would do so much damage. And brothers and sisters, the Bible tells you and me that the little spark of our words can do just as much damage to the people around us. Be careful with our words. When they're set on fire by hell, it says in verse 6, they destroy The words, though, in our, that come out of our mouth, they start in our heart, don't they? Jesus said, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Our word's origin comes from our heart, folks. And our heart and the words find an outlet through our mouth and our fingers. Handwritten notes, texts, emails, social media accounts. A few clicks on a piece of glass can do great harm to an individual. I wonder, have you ever read something typed about you that hurt you deeply? deeply? Whether it was a text message or maybe it was a social media post where somebody said something about you publicly or a letter. Have you ever read something or heard Words from someone's mouth that ripped you up inside. You ever been on the giving end? What about the positive side though? Have you ever read something in print that was positive about you? Or heard someone say something wonderful about you to encourage you? See, our words have, a, have great sway. <laughs> and we need to be careful. We need to be careful. We need to be stewards and good managers of our words. And the final thing we see in this passage in verses 7 through 12 is the sheer power of words. Look what he says in verse 7. For every kind of beasts and of birds and of serpents and things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. Think about it, right? The zoo 
go to a, well, you used to be able to go to a circus and uh, watch how they tame the elephants, right? And they could get the lions to jump through a fiery hoop and they could get an elephant to stand on one leg and throw somebody up on their back and, you know, do all kinds of fun things. And all kinds of beasts have been tamed. You have people who can charm serpents and you go to SeaWorld and you watch, you know, Shamu and, and all these different things. And all kinds of beasts on this earth have been tamed by man. But isn't it unbelievable that nobody can tame the tongue? It's untamable. It can't be contained. It can't be trained. It cannot be brought into submission. Here's the, here's the key. When it comes to your words, don't trust autopilot. Think about what your words could do if they came out of your mouth. And then he says in verse 8, But the tongue can no man tame it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poison. Folks, those aren't positive things. Verse 9, Therewith, with the tongue, bless we God. This morning we sang, Holy, holy, holy to the Lord. We said, I am thine, O Lord. We have praised God this morning. He says, we bless God, even the Father. And then verse 9, And therewith, with the tongue, we curse men. And here's the bad thing, James says. The men, the people, who are made after the image of God. What are you doing, he says. In one minute, you bless God, and the next minute, you curse men who are made in the image of God. It doesn't make sense. They don't belong together. Verse 10 says, Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. I'm reminded that at 11 o'clock we may be seeing holy, 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 and at 12.30 we may be taking someone in the church down the road to our family. What does James say at the end of verse 10? My brothers, my sisters, these things ought not so to be. Shouldn't be that way, he says. Blessing God in one moment, cursing His, his creation in the next. And then he asks us some questions that lead us to an answer, don't they? Verse 11, Doth a fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? You ever been to a spring that has both salt and fresh water? At the same time? No. Verse 12, can the fig tree, my brothers? Say, why does he keep saying my brothers? Did he forget who he's talking to? No. You know why he's saying that? Because he's reminding them. You're my brothers. You see, do you see, James has a pastor's heart, man. He's a pastor. He says, my brothers, look, my brothers, my sisters, listen, I care. I want you to know these things can be, a, harm can be avoided. And he says, can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? Of course not, that's funny. You know, he's, he's kind of talking about plants that grow in that part of the world. So in our part of the world, does a tulip bulb uh, bear apples? Haha, uh -huh, no. Does a tomato vine grow uh, watermelons? No. Right? It, it's funny. That's the point. It's silly. And so he says, how silly is it that in one minute we praise God and the next minute we curse His creation made after His image? It's not supposed to be that way. Something is wrong if we can so naturally praise God and slam people. So as we conclude this, this chapter, this passage this morning, we may be thinking, well, you know, every time, every, every once in a while a word will slip. And this, this is not what this passage is about. It's not about a word slipping. Although we do need to do our best so that it doesn't happen. You know what this passage is about? Who we are. About who we really are. It, it's about our words, Sure. But our words are just a mirror or a, a demonstration of our heart. And so what is in my heart? Do I love my brothers and sisters? Do I love them? What is in my heart? Have you ever had your heart truly changed? What I mean by that is, have you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior and had Him change your heart?
Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So the question is this morning, what's in my heart? And the answer is we can find out by what comes out of our mouth. What is it? If you'd stand with me, please, and Sandy's going to come this morning, and she's just going to play for us on the piano and for our time of invitation. Here's what I want us to consider this morning. The smallest word or briefest sentence carries great power. And so when it comes to my typing on my phone, do I think about what I'm saying before I do it? Is it am I considering, is this going to harm? Is this going to cause the testimony of Christ to be hurt? We need to consider these things. You know, the psalmist said, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord. That should be, before I type something, before I say something, that should be my desire. Lord, may what I put on this phone or may what I say in just a moment be acceptable in your sight. Is it something that you'd be pleased with? Let that be your guide this morning. So how is it? This morning she's going to play, and as she plays, we have an opportunity to do business with God. Uh, Maybe you would come forward to the steps here and pray and, and seal it with God and say, Lord, this is an area of my life that I need to work on. I need to work on my words. And and I'm coming this morning to say, Lord, I'm sorry, and I want to do a better job of rightly representing you and pleasing you with what I have to say and type. You can do that in your pew there, here at the steps, however you decide. If you're here and you need to be saved, you need to have your heart changed, trust Jesus today, would you do that? She's going to play, and as she plays, use this time to do business with God.